Awesome, thank you. All right, so like he said, I'll be talking about practical blend modes, but I'm also going to be talking about CSS filters and SVG filters too, if that's okay with all of you. A little mix of all the things. So I, like Vasilis too, love playing with CSS and using it for art. Here I have an example of these gradients that I made using a random function. Uh, randomize the colors and randomize the spread around the image, so every time I refreshed, I got a new bokeh effect on this image. Another example is just lamography, like playing with blend modes, you can play with colors and contrast and how they mix with each other. So as I was playing around with blend modes initially, like this one's called Accidental Cool Effect 2, good title, um, just started seeing all these results that I thought were really exciting. And here you can see a video of an infrared effect, so a surreal effect. You don't need the correct camera gear going out in the field when you can just do this by manipulating pixels in your browser. And my favorite, which is why I actually bought this shirt, um, is creating 3D images. So you can use light and dark and blend modes, intersect them, and apply different background colors to create instant 3D graphics in your browser. And because you can use animations in your browser, you can animate 3D. You can do so many cool things. I made a whole website just with all of these blog posts. There's a few different um, links there for how to create some of these effects. But after I do these talks, I feel like sometimes people are thinking this, they don't really say it out loud. So this woman's saying, do you make money from your art, this little boy? And he says, yes. And she says, really? And then this reaction. <laughs> so this boy is now crying when he realizes that he has lied. Um, anyway, my name is Yuna. I'm at Yuna on the internet. You can find me on Twitter or GitHub with this handle. As I was introduced, I'm a UI engineer at DigitalOcean. I also started a couple of SaaS meetups, so I started the one in DC, the one in Austin, and I also run a podcast, that's how it's spelled, Toolsday, toolsday.io, if you want to listen in. All right, so the idea here is to take your idea of blend modes from this glamorous thing that's not really useful, and show you how really useful it is. <laughs> We're going to mix these things, or blend them, if you will. I hate myself for that one, sorry. OK, so let's start with CSS filters, because they're the simplest thing. This presentation sort of starts with like one-liners and goes into kind of complex matrices. So CSS filters. The filters that you provided are blur, brightness, contrast, drop shadow, grayscale, hue, rotate, invert, opacity, sepia, and saturate. There are 10 of them, and they take different values. And here's a great visual that I found online. Um, so something, like most of them are uh, zero to one inclusive, but things like brightness and um, saturation can be above one. You can get some really intense values from those. And then your hue rotate is in degrees, blur is in pixels, m's, any um, absolute value there, and then drop shadow is an argument list. So um, support for them is not that great, but there are polyfills for um, these CSS filters, and they'll use canvas to manipulate the pixels. And here's just an example of using that one-line code. So um, this is my blog, wrote this blog post, created these images, and wanted them to fit in with that white background, right? So if you actually dig into this code, the images don't have a white background. I created these images on an airplane using the paper app, which means that their actual background is this like, light gray color. Um, but instead of opening them all individually in Photoshop, editing them, exporting them, putting them back into my my file here, I just opened up the browser with one line of CSS, was able to write um, WebKit filter brightness and had that higher than one, so I think it was like 1.1. Can also add a contrast here, and voila, this blends into my background with one line of CSS. Here's another example of where you can use filters like brightness very easily. Um, Dolce Gamana is just one of the many websites in the world that uses this identical pattern for a sidebar. So when you click, it's really great for focus states, right? So you want to defocus the rest of the page and make sure that the user's attention is on that sidebar. So you can do this with blend modes. You can use a brightness of less than one to apply this filter. With blend modes, you can also apply a blur or a hue rotate or any of the other 10 features that are available. So another cool thing that I wish had more support, but fingers crossed for this, is called Backdrop Filter. And it's currently only available in Safari, so I had to open up the Safari DevTools and learn how to use them for this. Um, <laughs> but 
Instead of applying a class to a body to get that filter effect, you can apply this backdrop filter to the overlay. So this site uses an overlay. I just went and I dug in. Here, you can see that I'm affecting that. Um, I added a blur so it wasn't just a darker background. I wanted some more focus on that sidebar, right? Um, so again, you could increase the brightness. Maybe I want that sort of effect. And then I could also decrease it. If I take this brightness and make it darker, make that brightness value less than one, I don't even need the line of code that creates this overlays um, sort of darkened black over, like overlay on the image. So with just that one line of code, with that backdrop filter, I'm applying all these effects instead of having all these different individual CSS files. It's like magic. It's like an argument list that goes on and on and on. But again, the support's not great. Dreams are dreams. It's behind an experimental flag in Chrome. You know, it's an idea. We hope for these things. Um, but here's another example of why backdrop filter is so useful. You can make this text on top of this element much more legible by blurring the background, maybe lightening it a bit. Um, and you see this pattern pretty often, especially on OS X. However, there is a hack that you can do today. That's a fun little thing. Um, here's an example of using it. It's sort of a fixed background hack, and I've seen this on the internet. It's really well versed in Leah's book, CSS Secrets. Um, but basically what you're doing is you're setting the background image of the page the same as the background image of that text element. And then on that text element, I'm applying my filters. So blur and brightness. Both of these backgrounds are fixed, and they're both position cover. So as you um, scroll through the page, it looks like it's staying in the same spot as the background, but really it's two different pictures. I'm not saying this is good for performance. It's a hack, but it's doable, and I think it looks pretty cool. <laughs> So filters are also cool for unveiling things. Maybe you're hiding something. Does anyone want to guess who this is? Oh my god, how did you know? <laughs> it's Justin Bieber. How did he get in my presentation? Um, and the opposite. So if you wanted to reveal text on a hover or an active state or a focus state, you're making it a little bit more legible by providing that background layer for that text. So here is just another example that you can see all of the different filters on hover, focus, et cetera. Now, you can think of this as potentially improving performance because you don't have to have a separate image download for your hover state. You can just apply CSS to create that visual effect. You're not having additional calls onto your server and on your browser. OK, cool. Filters are great, but blend modes, they're even better. Um, <laughs> I love blend modes so much. So there's so many more options for CSS blend modes. And we'll go through a couple of them, probably not all of them, but there's so much space to explore here. So CSS blend modes. These are all the options, and they come in different groups. So the first group is the darken group. It's darken, multiply, and color burn. Then there's light and screen and color dodge. Overlay, soft light, hard light. Um, that's their own group, then difference and exclusion. And the last four, they're pretty cool. They come together, hue, saturation, color, and luminosity. And we'll be talking about color a little bit, um, just kind of reiterating what was said earlier. So background blend mode has even a little bit worse um, coverage right now than CSS filters, but there are two different ways to use them at present. There's background blend mode, which applies to elements that have multiple backgrounds. It's a way to intersect the elements of that individual um, div or whatever you're putting the backgrounds on and apply it to just those multiple backgrounds. And there's also mixed blend mode, which you'll probably see more often. And what mixed blend mode does is it applies this blend mode to the element itself and it mixes it with the page surrounding it and the elements surrounding it. An example of multiply. So multiply is probably the most common blend mode. Have you heard of multiply? Yes, okay. Pretty much everyone's heard of multiply. What am I doing up here? I don't know. Um, so Here's an example of on the right, it is a multiplied image. On the left, this is both just a CSS background. But you can see that the depth is so, um, so much wider of a range of color where it's multiplied. And multiply takes the luminosity values. So it takes the luminosity value of the active layer's pixels and multiplies it by the luminosity, so that brightness value of the background layer's pixels. So that's what's going on here. It's like a transparency. So if you have two transparencies and you intersect them, any dark value will stay dark and light values will be completely transparent. And values in between will sort of figure out what that difference is. An example of this used in an interface is a website that I found on awards. I thought it was very clever. They used a black and white scheme throughout and this bright yellow pop of color multiplied throughout the website for consistency. And it looked really nice. This is the XOXO um, 
con conference um, website. And what I really liked about this is you can see that that blue background is multiplied on top of this layer of white and yellow. And you can see this transition as a user, as you're scrolling, interacting. It feels really cool. You can see this is code. It's not just a static image that's in your web page. And recently, I just saw the CSS Conf website for the Boston conference, which was really cool because they mixed SVG with these blend modes. And those SVGs are these transforming elements. They're like slowly moving on the page. Um, they have them blended on top of images, on top of videos. Um, so if you scroll down, it really creates this nice unifying factor. And they blend those with gradients, too. So it's just a nice unifying effect that you can see on these pages. The other cool thing about Multiply is you can create these artistic effects, but make them readable to screen readers and to search engines. Um, and here's an example. Previously, you could not create a visualization like this out of DOM elements, out of text elements, but now you can. So it's this image of this 81 that says 81. This could be a brand name. You could put this on your site as something that's searchable, something that's um, readable, and something that people can really understand, as well as screen readers. And here's another example. These are just ideas for bringing more art into the web. OK, so now we're going to talk about the screen blend mode. I'm going to have to play this video. OK, so what I like about this video is it shows multiply and screen. Um, this is multiply. Screen is literally the opposite of multiply. So the way that you take an opposite in luminosity terms is you subtract that luminosity value from 1. So um, what I'm doing here is, since multiply is a times b, I'm taking the inverse of the alpha layer's pixels times the inverse of the background layer's pixels, and then taking the inverse of that sum. So you're literally just like multiplying the brightness values here. Another cool thing you can do with blend modes is use different elements. You can interact with different elements here. So I have this example of this portrait of this woman, and um, I'm going to apply a video on top of that. So Let's see what we can do here. We can screen this and sort of just create like on the fly video effects. And then since it is just an element in my DOM, I can add filter effects, I could blur it, it is all animatable. So it looks, it looks cool, like you could probably see it better here on the dark. Um, and this whole thing all together is three, it's about 3.6 megabytes. The girl is 3.1 megabytes and there's a 0.5 megabyte um, Oh, sorry, she's 0.5 megabytes, and the video is 3.1 megabytes that I've put on here. It's an MOV, MP4s are even more performant than this. But if we compare that to a GIF, not only is it way more choppy, but the size is so much bigger. The size of this GIF is 24.7 megabytes for something equivalent <laughs> to that really, like, video that we just made in the browser. So just to compare those, 3.6 megabytes versus 24.7 megabytes, plus you get such a smooth interaction in that first example versus that second one. Um, so another example that I found in UIs of using blend modes is a screen blend mode. Um, love this example by Jan Druniak. He creates this menu where when you hover over it or you have it in a focus state, it expands and you can see what all the menu's elements are, but it contracts into this like, circle of color that's being screened on top of each other. Um, I thought that was really clever. People are also now using this for text masking. Uh, so with screen and multiply, also lightness and um, darken, light and darken, you can create text masks by using blend modes. I'm not saying that's the most performant thing. Um, CSS clipping mask is probably a lot more performant than this and using SVG, but it is possible. It's a thing that you can do and start to work with and try out. OK, so now we're going to talk about my favorite blend mode, which is lighten. And yes, I do have favorite blend mode. Um, I really like this example by, um, this is by Lucas Bonomi, and it is just a profile view, as we see often. But it's really nice. You can make this really flow well into your brand. So this is basically an image behind a gradient that's from going from like black to blue to some kind of gray again with light and blend mode. And light and will remove some of those details in the shadow. The way it works is this. It's looking at the RGB values rather than the luminosity channels. So we can start with this a color, and then if we lighten this pink color by, say, a blue, we get this violet color. And again, this is just done right in your browser. You can render, you can play around with it. Um, so what's going on here? If you think about it, the lightest color that we have, lightest color that we have is white. So that's RGB 255, 255, 255. Black is RGB 000. So we're going to compare these channels. What's lighter? 
190 or 40? 190, right. Um, what about the second one, 25 or 160? Yep. And then with the blue channel, it's 240. So that's how we get the values in this computed um, lightened color. So with blend mode lighten, you can create what I like to call the vintage washout effect. Um, you're creating a wash of shadow color and getting rid of some of the details in the shadow um, to, to get this effect that we see pretty often. In Instagram now, it's um, one of the features that you can do. You can apply this to your page to give it sort of like a vintage look. And the way that you do that is by using Lighten. So here I'm using the background blend mode because I'm using multiple backgrounds in this example um, and setting the darkest shadow color that I want. So if I want my darkest shadow color to be that bright yellow, it's going to wash out the whole page. But I find that dark blues or purples or browns work pretty well for this. And then just applying that blend mode of Lighten to that image. So it can help with readability as well. Um, this is a duotone. We'll talk about that a little bit later. But it is sort of taking away some of those shadows um, in the dark parts of this image and allows for that text on this side over here, on the right-hand side, um, to appear a lot more legible if you're reading this page. I like to use Spotify as another example of this effect, just like as an example in the shadows here. I love their end of year, year in music. Um, so this is something that we're going to see as a trend throughout the year. Does this look familiar to anybody? All right, let's talk about the CSS Day website now. Um, so we're going to talk about blend mode color by using this idea of icons. Blend mode color is fun. It's so fun that I brought a dog in. Um, so here's the dog. We're going to overlap this little fellow on this rainbow. And then we're going to apply a mixed blend mode of color to the rainbow layer. That's the active layer, so the one on top. So what's happening here is the color, so the hue and saturation values from that rainbow are being applied to the luminosity values, the brightness values of that dog. So around the head of the dog, you can see the white doesn't change. It stays white. The black around its ear stays black. But anything that's mid-tone will change color and it will become, it will take on the hue and saturation of that rainbow that's surrounding it, that's on top of it right now. And a way to sort of think about this is um, the Munsell color system. I like, this is the web edition, it's not the actual words that he uses. So Munsell uses chroma. I like to use saturation because that's the blend mode. Um, but that's like the pure value that is that the color retains. Then the hue is that value on the color wheel. And the luminosity is the brightness of that image. So these three are also their own blend modes, hue, luminosity, and saturation. And they work like this. If I wanted to use, say, the saturation blend mode, and I put um, an image on top of another one, that background image would take the saturation of the active layer, but it would retain its own hue and luminosity. So it would just either get really saturated or really unsaturated, but its color, its hue color wouldn't change and the um, blacks and whites of it wouldn't change. With color, it's actually taking two. So it's taking both the um, saturation and the hue. And it basically makes the image behind it like a black and white image. It's doing it for you. So you can see here, um, I also found this on awards. And it's just an image for this website that could be color, could be black and white if you use a blend mode. It doesn't matter, because with color, it will um, just use luminosity from that background. So back to these icons. There is a theme going on here where, you know, everyone is pink. Everyone is uh, colored in pink. And I was just cruising along on this website, looking through all the sessions and speakers, and then I noticed it was fine, but there was a mistake. One of the speakers didn't have an effect applied to their image. Um, you know, what if we could use CSS for this? We could embrace the cascade, right? So to fix this, we could just use blend mode color. Um, pseudo elements are great for this, so you can apply an after pseudo element and then apply that color block on top of the image and then colorize it. And the cool thing about doing it in the browser is you can just directly manipulate these colors. You can play, I really like using um, Google Chrome for this because they do provide a really nice set of features exactly for this. And then it could just blend in with the rest of the images. This could be a class. It will just cascade right down. Embrace the cascade in this case. Um, however, if you're using this, remember I showed you those charts with features that weren't really represented in all browsers yet? A thing that you could do is use our new knowledge of color, luminosity, and hue, and 
apply an after element that's behind the image. So if we apply this element behind the image and we apply the um, mixed blend mode of luminosity to the image, what it's doing is it's saying, use my brightness values and mix me with the elements behind me. So you're mixing the brightness values of the picture on the top of the color behind it. So this way, if the browser does not support blend modes, you'll see the image as it is just a colored image. Um, and when you mix blend modes with filters and gradients, you can pretty much create any sort of representation you want of a filter effect. So what gradients allow us to do is apply multiple colors on the same color plane and then mix those or filter those together. So I recreated a few Instagram filters. Um, here's an example. This is toaster. There's moon. Um, Lo-fi, early bird, 1977, you get the point. Um, so put this all together in an open source library called CSSgram. There's a link to it, always available um, for contributions, just saying, if you wanted to contribute. Um, but you can see there's hover states, some parts of it are animatable. Um, it's cool to just sort of see how these can be recreated completely in CSS using filters and blend modes. That's not the only one out there. There's also CSSGo, which recreates ViscoCam. And there's another one that is called colorfilter.css. And uh, here's a link to that one. I like this one because it really brings these pops of color. And towards the end, there are these, these gradients that you'll see. Um, so it's really cool to see people take this idea and really extend it further. So the next um, blend mode I'm going to talk about is called overlay. And overlay is applied in the text here. Overlay is interesting because it uses two of the blend modes that we already talked about. So overlay uses the screen blend mode on the lighter pixels at half strength, and the multiply blend mode on the darker pixels at half strength. So to see a better picture, um, here is one. If you look at the text, it's a little darker on the top, and it sort of flows down and becomes lighter here in this ca uh, calculator UI. And that's because it's taking that lighter value, screening it, taking the darker value, multiplying it. So it blends in with this calculator UI, making it very subtle. Another example of this is the border on this image here. So in the sky area where it's much lighter, that border becomes light, whereas in the darker area, in the ground, it's darker. It's much more subtle than applying just a white border around this image. OK, it's game time. Who can spot the differences between these two images? Just shout them out. OK, hat. Light. I heard light. Oh, the, the fl yep, the flower. Yes, the ketchup. OK, so this one was easy. This is not fair. But the difference blend mode would make this even easier. If I hover over this, you could see all the differences. So what difference blend mode was originally created for was for lining up transparencies and making sure that all the text aligned as we wanted it to. And now we can use it to cheat on kids' games. Um, but what, the way that it works is it takes the active layer is pixels, so it works in all the channels, RGB and A. It subtracts it from the background layer is pixels, and then takes the absolute value. So similar pixels, as we saw, will turn black. And pixels that stand out will show the color difference. So after I showed this example, um, Sarah Drasner decided to use this in real UIs. Look, imagine that, practical blend modes. Really great idea for visual regression testing. So with one line of CSS, you can take two different visual regression images of your application, website, anything, and see what the differences are between them. So after that, I created this little site called Diffy. It's diffy.me. And you can just input any two URLs if the header of that URL isn't blocked from like cross-origin uh, resource things which is always a fun thing you deal with with SVD and um, iframes, um, and see what the difference is between those two frames. So this works locally, because if you're behind your firewall, it will just work behind your firewall. Um, so it's great for sort of testing out your web pages and seeing if you've made any visual changes that you weren't anticipating before. Practical blend modes, really cool things you could do that are very useful. All right, so now we're going to talk about SVG filters. Um, and SVG folders are just so powerful. I love these little images of these women back in like the 30s. And this one had this vacuum, so it felt very powerful to me, but she's dangling it on her finger, so I loved that too. Um, thought it was perfect. So SVG filter effects. Before we start talking about SVG filter effects, I want to talk about your eyes for a moment. Have you seen these headlines about like, how using your computer at night is not really good for you? Like the blue light is 
It's going to keep you awake at night, messes with your sleep cycle. I'm going to show you a very short, it's like two minutes, video about this. The impact of screens on sleep. You know, people are exposing their eyes to this stream of photons from these objects that basically tells your brain, stay awake, it's not time to go to sleep yet. So it's 10 p.m., it's 11 p.m., it's 12 p.m., you're checking for email, you're looking for text, you're doing all these things. That light beams in you. It tells your brain, don't secrete melatonin yet, it's not time for sleep and you're up at 12, 30, you're up at 1, you're checking some more because you're up after all, why shouldn't you check? Now, you go to bed at 1, you wake up at 6 to get ready for work, that's 5 hours of sleep. We now know that what sleep is likely doing is allowing your active neurons to rest, which is fine, but more than that, the supportive cells, called glial cells, are now cleaning up the toxins that the neurons produce. And if you don't get from seven to nine hours of sleep, you just get five, the toxins remain there for over 95% of people. There are a small percentage of people who are genetically different, they don't need that much sleep, but for the vast majority of us, we need seven to nine hours of sleep. So even though it's like a badge of courage, I only had three hours of sleep last night and I'm working today, it makes your attention falter, your memory is impaired, your ability to think through problems is challenged. Your insulin even, that helps regulate your metabolism is turned upside down so you're more likely to gain weight from what you eat and eat more. And then, if that weren't enough, it's actually toxic to the connections in your cells. So, in your brain. So what you wanna do is prioritize sleep. Shut off your screens, let's say by 9 p.m. Give yourself an hour at least before you're going to bed and keep those screens off. It's a serious, serious problem for everyone and we can do something about it by actually actively deciding that's what we're gonna do, is take care of this aspect of the digital domain. All right, but who goes to bed before 9 p.m., right? So we're gonna solve this problem with SVG filter effects, as we do. Um, SVG filters are more widely supported than anything else I'll talk about here, which is great because they're also the most powerful, but they are the most complex. So let's try to break them down a little bit. This is kind of what we want to get. We want to get this, uh, getting rid of some of that blue light. We want some more of the yellow light um, in our images. And you can do this by, uh, like, in like per channel manipulation with FE component transfer. So FE component transfer is sort of a wrapper function for FE func R, G, B, and A. And it allows us to manipulate these channels individually, which is really powerful. We don't have this capability in CSS, but SVG is awesome. So let's see what we can do here. Uh, there are four types. So we're going to mostly be talking about linear and gamma, just because that's sort of like the direct transfer in Photoshop or Affinity Photo is what I showed. But there's also discrete and table, and if I had more time, I would love to talk about these, but I'm probably going to go over time anyway, so we're not going to. Okay, let's go back to our grade school days and talk about slope-intercept form and linear. So do you all remember y equals mx plus b? Okay, I heard some laughs, so there must be some kind of memory there unless you were up all night and slept through your classes because of all the blue light. Um, so essentially, we're looking at the slope and the intercept here as our points of reference. The intercept is the space on that y-axis where our line intercepts, so that could be positive or negative, and then the slope is how quickly that line rises. Um, and these are our inputs for the function of type of linear, for the FE function inside of FE component transfer, and this is how we can manipulate all these channels individually. Then there's also gamma, um, and gamma is often used to correct photos. So if you ever shoot raw, your image comes out kind of dull, it's because you're supposed to edit it afterwards. It's, it's a part of the process. So the image that we see with our eyes is different than the image that our screens see, as we just heard a great talk about screen color by, um, by Chris. And that's also different than the image that our, our eyes is, is seen in nature. So you use this gamma correction um, in your browser when you're editing your photos through Photoshop. But we can also do this in SVG. So our inputs are amplitude, exponent, and offset, 
And there's the formula that we can use, and we can apply this to all the individual channels that we have. OK, so do you all know Flux? How Flux is that program that we can set in our computers so that late at night it kind of reduces that blue light and applies with this yellow glow on our screens. Does anybody here use Flux? OK, that's actually half of you. I used it for a while, but then I got tired of it. Anyway, I'm going to introduce Flexible, which is a little demo that I made for this presentation. It's not real, but it could be real. It could very easily be real. Idea, open source project. Um, OK, so basically Flexible takes this and turns it into this by using that filter effect manipulation. It's a getting rid of some of that blue light, applying more orange and yellows. I thought the best way to start with this was to start with the image here. So I pulled up this image of this cat that looks like it's hovering over a city. And then I started playing with the values. So I played with these tables inside of Affinity, Affinity Photo, um, increased that red, decreased the blue. The green stayed at zero, but it went up a little. And this could translate pretty directly into SVG. So what does that look like? It looks like this. You give your SVG a filter. Give that filter an ID. I called it 1600K, which is representative of 1600 Kelvin, which is the temperature that we're going to apply when it's late at night. OK, so inside of that, we have FE component transfer. Inside of that, we have the RGB channels being affected. They're all being affected linearly because, as we saw a second ago, or it's right here, too, in this graph, it's a linear transformation. With the red, it's just an intercept transformation. The slope remains the same, but it's higher on that graph. Um, with blue, it's lower on the graph, but the intercept um, is a negative number. However, the slope doesn't change. With green, it intercepts at zero, but that slope changes. It slightly raises a little bit. So we have created this filter effect exactly how we wanted it with all the precision that we wanted it by transferring information from Photoshop or a design program into SVG. And then with just a little tiny bit of JavaScript, this is about three lines of JavaScript. Um, I spaced it out so it was easier to see. We're just going to apply a script that says if it's past 20 o'clock and before 5 o'clock, apply a class to the document's HTML. So we're applying this class of flexible 1600K. And then the CSS, what we're doing is just applying that filter there. So here, I just have it as um, it's taking that filter ID. So if I did it this way, then I'm assuming that the SVG is on that page. You can also. Um, store the SVG in your file system and link to it. So it could be like um, filters.svg hash 1600k. But there are a lot of cross-origin reference issues with SVG, so you can't really reference an SVG from a different domain. You have to be hosting those files yourself. So that's all for CSS. And if you're using um, Auto Prefixer, you don't even need the WebKit prefix. It could be one line of code. And this is kind of what it looks like on the web. So the New Yorker has the filter applied. It's very subtle. We can make it more um, in-depth if we wanted to. Here's an example on the Fitbit website. And voila, we have Flexible. The next thing I'm going to talk about is FE Color Matrix, which looks kind of scary. But when you understand what it is, it's very powerful um, and very easy to use. So to explain this, of course, more dogs, because who doesn't want more dogs in their presentation? Um, I'm going to show it with the CP effect. So Zibia is this vintage effect where you're applying a yellow hue over an image um, to sort of give it a vintage feel. And what it looks like in terms of an FE color matrix is this. It's just table of values. Um, something to note is that these values um, are sort of set to the values of the RGB spectrum. So those are 0 to 55. Um, but these values are going from 0 to 1. So in order to get the value of 0.14, you're dividing the number that you would want by 255 to set it up there. So just keep that in mind, it sort of is 1 to 1. 1 to 255 is this correlation here. Um, but it looks kind of terrifying. Like, what do these numbers mean? Right? But hopefully by the end of this presentation, you'll understand what they mean. It kind of works like this. Here is our FE color matrix, right? And what you're doing is you're creating new RGBA values based on the RGBA and M, M is a multiplier, um, values that go across. So you can set these across your matrix. The default matrix is 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, because you have red at the normal red channel value on the red channel. So the green line going across would be 0, 1, 0, 0, 0. Um, blue, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0. I'm not going to read this out loud, but that's, that's the default normal photo, what it looks like without any changes. Um, we get the RGBA channels to be 1, 1, 1, 1 on the side. There's no transformations there. Now, if you wanted to, say, remove all the red and blue values from our image, all we have to do is keep that green channel, remove the red and blue, and keep the alpha as we want it, because we don't want our image to um, go lighter or darker. We just want to keep those luminosity values as they are. It looks like this if we had that matrix on the bottom. 
just color as green. You don't have any red or blue values. Um, there's this really cool website where you can go online and play with this. It's kind of new. I just found it recently. Um, but you can click around on this FE color matrix and see how those values affect the image that you're inputting there. So here's a link. It's made by Kazkik. Um, kind of long. Maybe just take a photo of this. I also want to share out all the links in the slide a little bit later. Um, but it's a really great tool for understanding how FE color matrix works if you want a direct comparison in your browser. So another cool thing that I found is this example by Jose Manuel Perez. And what he did is he used JavaScript to recreate an FE color matrix that you're inputting a highlight color and a background color to. It'll dynamically generate a matrix for you that creates this duotone effect. I thought that was pretty cool. So basically, it just asks you for two RGB colors. Um, and you can just set whatever um, highlight and background you want. And he has that matrix in there that he's rewriting with JavaScript. So here's sort of a better look. And also a fun fact, this is using the sRGB color space. Um, just had a chat about that. And it does increase the contrast of this because it does um, sort of decrease the space for colors in between. And it kind of makes the dark colors take a darker color than they would, and the light colors take a lighter color than they would. Um, so it makes this image a little bit more contrasted. Um, so you can set the contrast space to either sRGB or linear RGB on SVGs, just, just as an aside. If this is too hard to read, I wanted to break it down a little bit more. So we have these two colors. We have red one, green one, blue one, red two, green two, blue two. And what we're doing is we're subtracting the second red value from the first one, dividing by 255 so that we can get that value that's 0 to 1 inclusive, um, and then going all the way down with the green and the blue values as well. And then on the multiplier, we're taking that second value, so that's the shadow color, and we're just taking that value and having it um, be divided by 255. So we get the right percentage of each channel as the background. If we wanted to do a simple example, like a bright red highlight and a bright blue shadow, I don't know why we would choose this. Um, it looks like this. The math is simple here. So the matrix that we get is 1 on the red channel, 0 is all the way across. Blue, um, the, the green channel, there's nothing there because we're just using red and blue. And then um, this blue channel, we have negative 1 since we're subtracting 1, the 255 from 0. And in the, the multiplier um, panel, we have it at 1. So it looks like this if we want to test it in that browser. So we're applying this on the red channel. But we can also apply this on the green channel or on the blue channel. It looks a little different, um, however you want. You can also um, sort of use this idea on any of these channels to make a grayscale um, in different, different modes. So I found this really cool blog. Um, created by this woman, Enos, and it's enos.io. And what she did is, for her visualization on her blog post as sort of the entry of these blog posts, she created a duotone for each one as the image. And she's not going through and manually editing these things in Photoshop and then putting them on her site. She's doing this dynamically in the browser. And she's also using a templating engine to do this, which I thought was really cool. So here there's like a data file. This is in JSON. And for each post title, she just has the image name and the colors she's choosing. Using that JavaScript function, running through it, creating an FE color matrix to sit at the top of her page that is going to be the FE color matrix that determines the duotone color on that page, and then applying it to the image. So just with a couple of lines of JSON here, you can create these dynamic images and put them in your UIs. All right, so in review, CSS is awesome when it works. I've become a little more cautious about saying this now. Um, so reasons not to do this. Don't do this because of the browser support, which I showed you throughout the presentation. Um, if you're going to do this and not use a polyfill, be weary of the layers so that if your browser is not supported, you're still presenting an image and not just a colored block to your user. Um, performance. So Downloading the image one time is going to be more performant than downloading the image, applying a filter, and repainting it, because then you have to recomposite it. There was just a great talk about that by Greg. So keep that in mind as well. You can't save the images. This might be a good thing for some people, but you can't save the images because it's a filter that's applied on top of the layers. It's actually applied like a lens on top of your graphic there. So when you try to save that image, you'll get the initial colored image behind it. And because of that, 
there's no thumbnail support, which means if you wanted to share something on Twitter or Facebook, you're going to see the original colored image that you had that's being read from the page itself. But do try this because performance. I know, I just put that on the last slide of why not to do this. Um, but I did show an example of that animation that did make it a little bit more performant if you're sort of using these blend modes with um, movies, not GIFs. I think the idea here is don't use GIFs. Um, and also, the images with the hovers, since you're not making another call, you don't have another image object on your website, you're just applying some CSS for the hover active states. So that could save on performance a bit. It's also really flexible. Um, so hover states and interaction are available when you apply CSS and SVG to your elements on the page. That's the medium that you're presenting it in anyway. Um, so there's a lot that you can do there with the DOM APIs. Consistency. So we saw that example with the cascading style. Embrace the cascade um, and use this to make sure that everything is even equal if you're using classes within your um, projects. Speed of prototyping. I think all of these tools and techniques, especially using them in Chrome um, with all the tools in the sidebar, is great for pair programming or pair designing because you get instant feedback, instant reaction within the UI they've already created. Um, so it's a really great way to just prototype and see what you get within the browser yourself. And then there's accessibility for more artistic designs. Um, those images that I was kind of showing earlier, you can make readable by the browser. They just don't have to be some kind of mesh of visuals. You can also highlight over them if you want some better legibility there as well. And exploration. I think this is really important to think about. There was a great talk earlier about this. Um, this is just the new way to design. It's like painting in the browser. Like This is how things are going. We need to stop getting inspiration from our websites for up from other websites. Like, th we saw this earlier. Uh, websites are starting to look the same. You look at them, they have that big header, they have the text on top. Like, Vasalis was totally right about this. There's so much more that we can pull from. Architecture, jewelry, patterns, clay making. There's so much out there in nature that we don't have to just go to, like, awards.com and see what all the other websites look like and then try to copy that. Or have clients say, I want that. You know, bring, bring more ideas in there. I want to see a beautiful web that's performant when browsers start to also implement more of these things. That'd be lovely as well. So this is a cool website. It's called um, Evolution of the Web. It's evolutionoftheweb.com. And it shows where we were and where we are. I wish it was a little bit more updated, but it still sort of proves my point here. Browsers have come such a far way. So here's an example, um, and this is CSS3 animations. I'm not sure if you can read that. So CSS3 animations are pretty recent, right? Here's Flexbox, also a very recent spec. They just started getting full support. But here are CSS filters. They're just starting to gain momentum. They're just starting to gain traction. So now's the time to explore, to push the web browsers, to accept and support these. This is the new way to design in the browser and use them in your UIs in a very practical way. So be an explorer and art the web. Thank you. Can you, can you pull up that um, YouTube video? Can you get back there to that one about the sleep thing? Oh, yeah. Um, or is that going to take like I, a real long time? I think it's on that screen. Oh. No, it's not. No, it's uh, You got it. Well, it's going to take a while. I just wanted to make an observation about that. The guy who was doing that video looked like he hadn't slept in like five weeks. He had a blue screen <laughs> behind him. I don't know what the, what the idea there was. All right, there it is. Yeah, well, OK, well, watch this. <laughs> I'm going to turn I'm the volume down so it's even better. Bloodshot eyes. and. <laughs> He's been working on this project for days now, maybe months. <laughs> Ain't no one got time for sleep. He needs some SVD filters in his life. Okay, I'll stop. But I will leave it there. The, the guy in spot. bed looks more awake than he does. <laughs> it's so good. Yeah, it is good. Come, come and join me. So, um, All right. Thank you very much. That's a, that's a great talk, very inspiring. Um, I think that when you see stuff like what you were talking about, that one of the things that pops into everyone's head, especially because it's kind of popular to talk about is performance. Yep. Um, so in, uh, in practical terms, how do we convince stakeholders? <laughs> no. 
I'm just kidding. <laughs> but uh, what, if you're doing a, an actual project, where, where would you, on an actual project, draw the line with uh, using all the stuff you were talking about? Would you combine a lot, or would you see it more as an uh, enhancement in this phase? How would you approach that? I think it's definitely an enhancement, especially when you're talking in business terms of supporting more browsers. Um, if you're using SVG filters or CSS filters, those are pretty well supported. And CSS filters are not that bad for your um, browser rendering. Um, blend modes will make your fans spin. Especially if you animate them. Oh my gosh, do not animate blend modes. I've seen this before. Um, however, I did do a study where I tested canvas blend modes, um, CSS blend modes, and SVG blend modes to see which was the most performant and least performant of the three, um, and found that SVG blend modes was the most performant. CSS was, no, the CSS was the most performant. SVG was close background. Um, canvas was pretty bad because canvas is actually changing each pixel individually, so it's really doing a repaint. It's not just a layer, it's not a lens on top. Um, and those were just a little bit slower. It was like one millisecond slower than having the actual image that was pre-manipulated show up on the DOM. And this was a grayscale effect. Okay, so my so answer is uh, use it to in your caution, but it's not that bad. <laughs> yeah, and don't animate a blend mode. So yes. the person who asked the question, are blend modes animatable? <laughs> don't do that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so caution tape. <laughs> yeah. You said you should uh, make sure to not just show uh, users a colored block if blend modes aren't supported. Um, but what if your name is Facilis? He, I think he can do whatever he wants, and he will. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. He said he animates blend modes, so we're good to go. It's covered. So what, um, uh, what excites you the most? What would you like to see happen uh, quickest? Backdrop filter. Okay. I really love Backdrop Filter. I think it is a shame that it is so little supported, but I'm really rooting for it. It's like my little, like I'm stoking this fire, hopefully, like, please work. I need to start talking to browser vendors and saying them cookies or something. And what's the first thing you would use it for? Um, I really like the effect where you can take elements and move them around the screen, so manipulate them, any sort of sidebar things, anything where you have to focus on an individual element or defocus. I think backdrop filter along with blur is very useful, um, as well as lightening or darkening a series or a space on a page. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, well, that's all. No one else has questions, so I'll just ask questions. <laughs> all right. <laughs> all right. Um, so you gave the example of the uh, CSS Today uh, website, and I, uh, that, that wasn't entirely uh, an error, but uh, in a way it was. But the interesting thing about what you showed, I thought, was the, the way you used the um, dev tools to figure out exactly where you needed to be. So you're using dev tools as a design tool. Mm -hmm. um, is that something you do all the time? Yep, <laughs> pretty yeah. much. Um, there was a time where I just got Photoshop, but I didn't have Photoshop for like a solid three or four months. And I realized I really don't need it if I'm just manipulating these things in the browser where I need to. So if I have a UI or a design drawn out like a sketch and then you put it in the browser, um, you can fine tune it, anything you need, like placement, you can hit like shift and up and down that, um, in, like the numbers go up by 10. Um, I think like control goes up like 0.1. There's just a lot of um, different shortcuts there. So you sort of start learning shortcuts in dev tools like you would learn shortcuts in Photoshop. And it just became pretty, pretty much what I used. I didn't really need an external program that I had to pay a lot of money for and then open separately and edit in there. And do you, do you save uh, straight to a file from, from dev tools? Or do you kind of copy what you've done in dev tools? And uh, paste it into your editor? So you can save directly with source maps, like with CSS source maps, um, but I don't like to do that because I don't want to accidentally save something that I didn't want to keep. So I'm more deliberate in where I change the properties and then I'll go and copy and paste it back in. Okay, okay. Well, um, thank you thank you for your talk. It was very, very nice. And uh, please give a hand to Una Kravitz. <laughs>